wonderful weekend. We appreciate uh, all the effort of all those who diligently uh, uh, to uh, put together this, uh, this youth event uh, this weekend, and we look forward, Father, to the culmination of it here, uh, not the culmination of having to see Joe and Aaron and the children uh, leave us, but rather just to put a, uh, icing on the cake, so to speak. We appreciate all of Joe's efforts in preparing the lessons that have been so great and so vital to our young people and to those of us that have listened attentively as adults. Thank you for blessing us with his presence. And as always, Father, thank you for blessing us with your word. Uh, we appreciate so much the power that it can work in each of our lives and in those with whom we come in contact. Bless us through this time together now we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. has truly been a good weekend. I appreciate uh, so much the leadership here allowing us to participate. Appreciate the uh, opportunity to participate in the youth rally uh, and then to uh, preach today. And so as I said yesterday to the eldership here, thank you for the relationship we've been able to build over the years. Um, it's hard to believe. I, I don't even know when I first started coming, uh, but I know I was preaching in the old building sometimes. Uh, and then through Tahoe, we've just grown, and uh, I love seeing it continue. And uh, Lord willing, if God continues to use me this way and continues to bless this congregation, perhaps in the future, maybe at other youth rallies, the Bible bowls, things like that, we can work together again. Uh, we've enjoyed our time with you. I'm glad Aaron and the kids were with us. Um, we even got to drive by and see a house that Aaron used to live in here. So a little bit of history for our kids. Uh, which you and I both know that if you can tie your children to the history, it helps them know where they've come from. And so this was a good trip for us. So thank you for that. Let's go to our Father in prayer. Um, I know I want to respect time. I'm guessing it's a 45-minute time period. All right. So uh, what we're going to do is I'm going to say a word of prayer. And then I've asked Joe to play a video uh, off of YouTube to start our Bible class today. Uh, and so, Joe, after the prayer, if you don't mind, just go ahead and start that and then um, he'll pull up my PowerPoint. Let's go to our Father in prayer. Lord, you are so good, and we're grateful for the rest that we've received. But Lord, to wake up and to see a beautiful day, we're grateful that you have allowed us to breathe the air today, allowed us to interact with those that we've had the opportunity thus far, and, and those that we will. And Lord, we pray that every, every interaction that we have, that, that we understand, Lord, and appreciate the opportunity to direct souls to you. Lord, thank you so much for the church. Thank you for this congregation. And I pray you continue to use her in this context. Thank you for Matt and Tracy and the good work that they're doing here. Lord, I pray your blessing to be upon them and continue to use them here for many, many years. Lord, as we enter into this time of study, I, I do pray that our hearts are ready, not just uh, to be here, but that our hearts are ready to receive. And so, Lord, I pray that uh, we would dedicate ourselves to this time of study together so that we may grow. And I pray as the teacher, Lord, that I do stay out of your way and what is said is in accordance to your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Go ahead, Joe. Thank 
I start off with that this morning because I wanted you to see how a company who sells chicken was able to draw you in beyond the chicken. And I do that because, number one, they're closed on Sunday. Shame on them, right? No, I'm teasing. That's a good thing for them. But here's what I wanted you to understand. What they did so well is what I want to talk about with you today, and that is this. You and I oftentimes see the surface but we don't see what's going on underneath the surface. And the whole point of that video, when you really think about it, it was a, a, a restaurant selling a, a food item, but really they weren't selling a food item in that, that commercial. What they were trying to sell you was the fact that Chick-fil-A cares more about you and about their people who come into their store than about the bottom line of a dollar. Now, whether that's true or not, you be the judge of that. Uh, I tend to think there's something a little different with that company. But here's what I want you and I to think about today is this. How do we grow to see beyond the surface? Because as you think about walking in the footsteps of Jesus, that's what we're talking about. We've, we've been talking about that since Friday night as we looked at Jesus, a friend of sinners. How he was labeled a friend to the sinners by the religious elite of his day because they saw him having a meal with people that they had written off. And we talked about that when you really want to follow in the footsteps of Jesus, it will cost you. It will cost you time. It will cost you financially. It will cost you at times even in your reputation as other people around you observe. And if they've already written that person off, they conclude, well, it's not worth your time. Well, here's what I want you to know. Jesus didn't think the way the popular uh, mindset was of the religious elite of his day. He saw value in Zacchaeus. He saw value in Matthew, the tax collector. He saw value in a woman who was called in adultery. He saw value in the people that were discarded by others in his time. Now, here's the deal. I'm not suggesting to you that you shouldn't worry about being the light and the salt. We mentioned that, that you do need to be aware of your reason. Jesus didn't just hang out with them because he was bored. Jesus always had their spiritual best interest in mind. And so that's why he didn't overlook them. We talked about yesterday uh, the value of learning to walk like Jesus, learning to talk like Jesus, and learning to listen. Well, this morning, what I want us to do as we come to a conclusion of this, this kind of concept, I want us to learn to see a little differently, perhaps to see like Jesus. I want you to look up at the screen, if you will. I've got a couple exercises here for you just to kind of gaze into this. And maybe you've seen them before. I don't know. But uh, I don't know what you see when you first look at this picture. How many of you see an older man? Raise your hand if you see an older man. Okay, raise your hand if you see a man on a horse. Okay, raise your hand if you see a tunnel with a river running through it. Yeah, isn't it interesting that the more you look at things, the deeper you study them, the more that you actually glean from the picture. What about this one? If you've seen this one before, then you already know what it is, but... If you have not, I want you just to kind of go off your first impression. How many of you see an old man 
that has kind of like a soldier's uh, shoulder uh, decoration on it. You see that? Yep. How many of you see a man who's grabbing kind of his coat there? Yeah. How many of you see a dog laying in the street? Yeah. How many of you actually see a man, an older man with a sombrero and a younger lady with her dress holding a baby? Isn't that interesting that the closer that you look, actually, if I'm not mistaken, the hair of the man almost looks like wheat on her shoulder as she's holding a baby. It's interesting. The longer you study something, the more that you learn from it. What do you see in this picture? I don't know what you see. Many of you see a frog, I know. But you know what's interesting? When you change perspective, what do you see now? You know, that's the exact same picture. Just turned on a different angle. And why do I show you all that? I show you all that because sometimes the way that we perceive things right out of the gate, it really does hinder us from seeing things any other way, right? And I don't, I, I don't want to sit here and say that perhaps we've never struggled with that when it comes with people. I mean, after all, um, you know, we, we, we've seen homeless individuals when we drive throughout the country. Um, we've actually, you know, I, I, would, I would try to utilize those interactions with individuals who were maybe asking for money or asking for help as a way to teach my children. Quite honestly, I, if I'm just going to be open to you, uh, knowing that that was an opportunity for my children to see me interact with somebody uh, like that in that predicament in life, I, I knew that it was going to be good whatever we could do for that person. But in the back of my mind as a dad, I'm going, man, my kids are watching me. They're going to watch me if I drive by. They're going to watch me if I say no. They're going to watch me if I say yes. And in the back of their mind, they're going to have questions. Now, there have been times in dealing with individuals who were asking for money that, um, you know, we would actually help. Now, my default is not to give money, but there have been times that I did. Um, and there have been times that I know as I walked away, I said that I was scammed. But I free willingly gave in to that. Now, I used to struggle with that a lot. Uh, when I was much younger, I worked at a congregation in Brentwood, Tennessee, and uh, we had a protocol there. I was a youth minister. And, uh, Brother Phil Sanders was the preacher at the time, and so uh, we had a protocol, and that was if somebody came to the church building door, that we had a deacon who had been assigned keep a list of everybody, and you came in, you filled out a piece of paperwork, that deacon was called, he checked check against the records, his records, that individual's information. He could pull up, well, we helped him on this date, we helped him on this date, we helped him on this date. He could pull up their story. Well, last time they came in, it was about a sister who needed this, or maybe they were heading to this place and they ran out of gas and they needed this and this. And, well, there was one time a person came to the door, and I knew the protocol, but there was an older gentleman working there by the name of Jim Cooper, and Jim Cooper went to the door. I'm talking old man now. I know some of you all have walked a, a day or two. Jim Cooper had walked about a week of it. He walked hunched over. I don't know how he was the maintenance guy. We used to tell him, don't get on top of the roof, but he wouldn't listen. He was one of those kind of old guys, right? I'm going to do what I want to do, and when I die, I die. You don't need to tell me otherwise, right? Well, Jim Cooper walks up to the door, and he answers the door, and somebody tells him the story. He pulls his wallet out and gives him some money. Well, I walked up to Mr. Cooper. I'm what, 20, 23, something like that? I walk up to Mr. Cooper. I said, Mr. Cooper, I said, why'd you do that? I said, you know that we're supposed to take their information. And I said, how do you know they're not going to misuse the money that you gave them? And Mr. Cooper, with his wisdom, his spiritual maturity, smacked me right in the face. And he said this, Joe, I am not accountable for how they use the money. I am only accountable whether or not I answer the call to help people. And I closed my mouth. I picked my, you know, picked my pride up off the ground and I walked back to my office and I said that was probably the best lesson I've learned in a long time. Now we've been scammed before. We've had an individual asking for money. I went to buy him something uh, in the store. We were getting ice cream cones. Colton was with me. I said let's get him one too. And we got him an ice cream cone. I said Colton you want to go give it to him? Went to give it to him. He goes I don't want that. I wanted money. Well that gave us a great opportunity for Colton and I to have a conversation about not everybody who presents themselves a certain way is actually what they are, right? Now, here's the hard part. Did we know that? 
No, and part of the reason we don't know that is because we can't see to the core of a person, can we? We're limited in what we can see. Now, here's the, here's the bottom line, though. While you and I are limited by what we can see because we have a starting point and a perspective, the good thing is that God doesn't have your starting point. Now, here's the other side of that, though. He expects you and I to grow. Now, I'm going to go ahead and tell you right now, your growth is limited in this area. It's limited in this area because you're not God, and neither am I. All we can do is try to see people the way that Jesus saw people, and specifically what we're going to study today, the way God sees people. So I want you to do something. Open your Bibles to a familiar passage, 1 Samuel chapter 16. You already know this, so it's not necessarily going to be a, a great... Um, uh, you know, eye-opening experience. This is the anointing of King David. But what I want you and I to do is I want you to, to go on this journey with me. Allow yourself to go on this journey, to participate in the class, and even if it's something you've studied before, allow yourself to walk this, this journey with me. So here's what we're going to do. Let's start reading 1 Samuel chapter 16. Well, before we do that, let me ask you this, since it is a class, why is it that we are now turning our pages to where Samuel's going to anoint David? Somebody tell me what had happened. I mean, after all, there already is a king. Who's the king? Saul is the king. He was disobedient to the will of God, right? To the will of God. One of those particular occasions was he offered a sacrifice when he was told to wait, right? That's one of those occasions. Either way, the kingdom was going to be taken away from him, which is quite interesting because Saul was the man who hid when uh, it was time to anoint a king. And it's almost like we see an over overabundance of humility, maybe on his part, um, where a guy goes and hides, you would almost think, well, he doesn't want to be the one in charge. He doesn't want to be the one in, at show, but God is the one that has selected him. You've got to understand that. As God has selected David, God has selected Saul. But in selecting the individual, he did not determine whether or not Saul was going to be obedient. Saul had free will just as David had free will. But what we do see is that the kingdom was going to be taken away from Saul, and so David is going to be anointed. And so in chapter 16 of 1 Samuel, verse 1, the Bible reads this way. Now the Lord said to Samuel, How long will you grieve over Saul, since I have rejected him from being king over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and go. I will send you to Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I have selected a king for myself among his sons. But Samuel said, How can I go when Saul hears of it? He will kill me. And the Lord said, Take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. You shall invite Jesse to the sacrifice, and I will show you what you shall do, and you shall anoint for me the one whom I designate to you. So Samuel did what the Lord said and came to Bethlehem, and the elders of the city came, trembling to meet him, and said, Do you come in peace? In other words, Samuel's reputation had gone before him. People knew who Samuel was. He, Samuel was not an unknown figure in that time. And so when the elders saw him coming, um, there was concern on the part uh, of their, their own heads because obviously if there was something going on that was negative, if they participated in it, possibly they would view it as a condemnation or a judgment by God. Uh, but it's also possible they were maybe afraid of what was going on and maybe Saul would figure it out. After all, Samuel was talking about Saul killing him. Maybe these elders were as well. Either way, what we do learn is this, that, that uh, they came and said, do you come in peace? Verse 5, he said, in peace I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Consecrate yourself and come with me to the sacrifice. And He also consecrated Jesse and his son and invited them to the sacrifice. And when they entered, he looked at Eliab and thought, surely the Lord's anointed is before me. Now I want to stop there for a moment. We don't know everything that, is the reason why he thought Eliab was the guy, right? Some people look at that and they say, well, the oldest, maybe uh, an individual who presented himself a certain way, an individual maybe that would have had the right um, maturity, the right look, the right stature. I'm not sure. The Bible doesn't tell me in that text, verse 6, why. But in verse 7, it gives an indication. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not look at his appearance, or at the height of his stature. This individual obviously presented himself a certain way. So let me ask you this. Have you ever known someone 
who presented themselves a certain way, but in reality they were anything other than what they presented themselves to be. That happens, sometimes it happens to you and I. If we're going to be honest with ourselves, you, we would love to think, oh no, we're always authentic. It was funny the other day, we were talking, yesterday I was talking with a brother, and he was uh, talking about how sometimes, you know, driving in from outside, we'll, we'll have an argument, or maybe we'll be getting on to our children, and talking about how we're going to, don't make me come back there, stuff like that, you know. Back in the day, our parents had a great, I don't know how they disjointed, you know, they dislocated their shoulder to reach behind the seat to get our legs, but they did. And then you show up at the church building, and somebody greets you at the door and says, how are you doing? And you, you say, well, I'm doing great. How are you doing? You know, and the reality is this. Sometimes you are doing great. Sometimes, though, you're still hot. Sometimes maybe things aren't great. But when somebody asks you at the door, how are things going? Oh, it's great. Sometimes we say that, and the reality is maybe everything in life's not great. So we put up a mask, a facade. We don't mean to. I'm not suggesting to you that we mean to be dishonest. Sometimes people who ask, how are you doing, if I'm just going to be real with you, they don't want an answer to that question. Because can you imagine you walk in, how are you doing? Well, I'm glad you asked. you got about an hour. Let's sit down and talk. Well, no, I don't really mean to ask how you're doing. I meant just to give you a bulletin. You know, you ever done that before? You, you kind of have these niceties that you say. Some people would say down south, we have a lot of niceties. As long as it's follow, uh, you know, started with bless your heart, you're good. Then you can say whatever you need, but blessing the heart makes it available. Okay, but the idea is this. You think about how appearance can be deceptive. I'm not suggesting to you that Eliab was trying to deceive. What I'm suggesting to you is this, that God said, if you only spend your time looking at appearance and stature, you're going to miss the one whom I've selected as king. So he said, don't do that. Don't do that. So let me ask you a question, right? This is a class. How do I learn to look beyond appearance and stature? Somebody tell me. What would you say? What would you say? Get to know. Now that presents a problem. Because in order to get to know somebody, what, what does that involve? What would you say? Listening, time, right? You don't necessarily get beyond the appearance and the stature the first time you meet somebody. It takes time. What else? What else? What is involved with seeing beyond the appearance and the stature? Do what? Oh, you mean I got to be quiet. And I got to let other people talk. And as they talk, they will reveal their heart. They will reveal who they are. You are right, correct. And that takes time. What else? What would you say? What, what is involved with not being wrapped up in the appearance or stature of other people? Do what? Don't judge them based upon that. that. That is absolutely true. And now here's the reality. They, uh, God was warning Samuel, don't judge him positively, right? You can judge people positively, right? I mean, after all, I, I have a nice white shirt on. I put a tie on. You say, yeah, but you already got rid of the coat. That's because I don't want to die of sweat, right? But the idea is this, that when I put this on, if I were to walk around in culture, now look, I'm going to ask you to be kind to me, but if you saw a guy like this walk into a store, what would you think? What would you say? Uh, brother, that's, that's kind. Thank you. I'm not sure if you just threw up a little bit there or what happened, but appreciate that. No, I'm teasing. What would you think? Here I come walking into your shop. What are you thinking? Come on, don't hold back. What are you thinking? A religious group. What else? Respectable because you dressed up, right? What, what else? A businessman. Right? Farmers don't typically dress this way. What else would you think? Uppity, perhaps, especially if I'm in a community that nobody dresses this way. Somebody, what would you say? Big dude, so you're judging me by size, okay? I, I understand that. I take that for my credit. Somebody might think, oh, he's got money. Can you imagine if I walked into a car lot dressed like this? Somebody would say, ooh, we're going to show him these cars over here. Now, here's the deal. All of that is based upon reading somebody. 
And here's the reality. We do that daily. We do that daily. But I love what you said. Don't judge them. Because sometimes the people who are the most plain, those are the ones that are amazing in their story. You know, it, it's quite interesting that you would think that the people who dress it have it. Sometimes the people who dress it are leasing it. Sometimes the people who dress it are borrowing it. Sometimes the people who dress it are so in debt that if a collector called, their house of cards would come tumbling down. And I've met some individuals. I'll never forget this. This guy, imagine Santa Claus as a hillbilly. Okay, now just in that mind, I want you to picture that image. In the North Alabama area, when I was preaching there, we would have a, a, a silent, or not a silent auction, it was a flea market, basically yard sale, and then an auction to benefit the North Alabama Christian Children's Home is affiliated with the church. Their director attended Florence Boulevard where I was preaching. Every year the Florence Boulevard congregation would help put it on. You go there and eat hot dogs, hamburgers, goat stew, chicken stew. I mean it was it was probably what you think of when it comes to the south but it was good stuff. But this guy showed up every year and he looked like Santa Claus as a hillbilly. And I, he, you couldn't help but be drawn to the man. Because he was so odd. And the director of the children's home came up to me. He goes, you watch him. And he called him Mr. I can't remember his name. He didn't call him old Joe. He didn't call him old Jim. He said, you watch Mr. So-and-so. I said, who's Mr. So-and-so? He goes, Santa Claus. Santa Claus, I couldn't tell you how many thousands of dollars he dropped on that auction. He bought a whole thing of knives and gave one of my boys one just because. I still have it in my safe at home. Come to find out his story, Santa Claus Hillbilly, he owns multiple properties and he puts battered women or abandoned men, who women whose husbands have just abandoned them and their families, he lets them live in those homes without charging them a dime. He pays everything for them. He would buy at that auction not only to support the children's home, but to provide furniture in those homes. They are fully furnished. These women do not have to worry for anything because Santa Claus Hillbilly, who come to find out, if I'm not mistaken, was a millionaire. He didn't come into a car lot dressed like me. He drove an old pickup truck. Santa Claus Hillbilly, you would have never thought that he was a millionaire. Why do I say that? Because sometimes we can judge people negatively as well as judge positively. But we got to listen to their story. And until I found out his story, it was like, oh, that's why Don called him Mr. Right? Now, why do I say all that? I say all that because back in our text, I would say that Samuel probably did what the majority of us do with people. He looked at the first impression. And God told him in verse 7, But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not look at his appearance or at the height of his stature, because I have rejected him. Did Eliab do anything wrong to be rejected? We don't know, but I don't see anything in this text that says Eliab did anything wrong. But what we do know is he was rejected. For God sees not as man sees, for man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the what? Heart. Now, here's what I tell you. You and I are limited in this area. Because if I tell you that you're able to see just as God was able to see, and that you can look at the heart just like God looks at the heart, then I will tell you this, that makes verse 7 not true. That makes verse 7, and here's why. For man looks at the outward appearance, but God looks at the heart. Samuel couldn't see the heart of David. But God could see the heart of David. Jesus was able to see beyond the first impression and even the impression of being blind, lame, sick, caught in adultery, tax collector, sinner, an individual that other people had written off because he had the ability to see the heart of people. You and I are not deity. I need to make sure you hear me say that. 
Because if I tell you, you can see to the heart of people in the same way that God did, that makes you like God in that area, and you and I aren't. So what we observe are fruits. Do you understand what that is? Right? We had a good opportunity to go over to the Blair's house last night and eat and uh, see some oranges and eat an orange and see apples and grapes and all kinds of cool things, persimmons. I think that's it, right? Not persimmons, persimmons. Pomegranate, whatever they were. No, it's my story, man. Be quiet. No, I'm teasing. No, we were joking last night. We had a good time. But the idea is this. All those fruits are supposed to tell you what kind of tree it is, right? And so you'll know a tree by its fruit. You and I observe fruit. And therefore, we draw conclusions about the, the place that fruit came from. And I believe that's biblical. I absolutely believe that's biblical. We're told to, to show fruits of repentance, right? That's that's biblical concept. Um, the book of Matthew chapter 7 tells us that we're going to know if the tree is good or bad based upon the fruit. I mean, that's a, a biblical concept. And so when we observe fruit, I, I just, I'm curious, do we observe fruit and then reach conclusions and walk away? Or do we observe fruit and kind of hit the pause button? And you say, Joe, why would you do that? Here's, what, or what are you saying? Here's why I'm saying, because when I see that God saw the heart of David and he told Samuel not to look at the outward appearance or the stature, he said, because God doesn't see as man sees, God sees the heart. My question is, what heart did he see in David? And so here's where I start, right? You're going to know these. 2 Samuel chapter 11, a major event occurred in the life of David. Now, probably teaching a lesson on David is one of those that everybody says, oh, I've studied that. Well, you've studied this one, I guarantee it. Because 2 Samuel chapter 11 was with the occasion with Bathsheba. So let me ask you this, as you understand what, what occurred here, David was on the top of the, of the roof. Uh, others were not there. Of course, I think it's quite interesting, the time period. Um, David looks and he sees a woman bathing. He's drawn to her. Um, did David know that that's where women bathed? I don't know. Did Bathsheba know that that was the king's roof and from time to time he walks on it? I don't know. There are some individuals that when you study this out in its totality was, were both of them innocent at the beginning? In other words, was David up there just kind of walking around and Bathsheba was just kind of showering and therefore neither one of them really intended to see or be seen? Um, that seems to be what the text indicates. Other individuals have looked at it and said, well, was David not in the habit of going up on the roof at this time of the day and was Bathsheba aware of that? I mean, some people try to draw so much out of this. Let's just leave it as it is. I have no reason to believe there was intent in either of their parts. But what we do see is David did have intent when he sent and inquired about her. And when he found out that she was somebody else's wife, that did not stop him. And not only that, when he found out she was with child, he then tried to deceive the husband to call him back, which, by the way, Uriah was one of his mighty men of valor. You want to talk about Navy SEALs on steroids, that's what these guys were. When you read their accounts, what they were able to accomplish, what they were able to do with ridiculous odds against them, there's no doubt in my mind God was with these men. But Uriah comes back and he has so much more integrity than David has. Because he says, I will not lie with my wife while the soldiers that I fight with are out there fighting. David would tell him, no, you need to go and lie with your wife, and he wouldn't do it. He was sitting back, and then what happened to Uriah? Somebody tell me. Put in the middle of the battle, and when the battle got the hottest, what did David command the leader of his army to do? To pull him back, right? And leave Uriah out to die. That, that is the man that God said, I look at his heart. So let me ask you this. Either one, we've got a problem with God, because either God sees and God knows all, or He's not God. 
And if he saw David's heart, and he would know that it was possible for David to make decisions such as that, what does that say about David? What does that say about God? And here's, here, that's a rhetorical question. I want it kind of just to sit there and marinate a bit. Here's what I do know. When God would claim that David was a man after his own heart, that did not mean David was perfect. It did not mean that David was a God. It was something else that was there. But here's the deal. You and I judge based upon fruit. So let me ask you this. Another man comes in, or a man comes in and takes another man's wife. Gets her pregnant, then has her husband killed. You and I judge on fruit, what would you say is that man's uh, heart set? What would you say? Selfish. Not good. What else? I would say evil. I'm not going to hold back. Because that shows bad intent. That's not just that I stumbled into a situation. That shows motive. And yet, that's the man that God chose to be king. Now, it's not just that alone. When you really think about it, look over at 1 Chronicles chapter 21. This is one of those oftentimes um, overlooked situations, unless um, you've studied the Chronicles, which I, believe it or not, I've loved the study of the Old Testament and the Chronicles. It, it was initially just one book. Um, So that's why you see the Chronicles. Um, It's a post-exilic book, which means after they come out of captivity, uh, you find this book written recounting what got them there, warning them not to go back there, reminding them of their history. Um, We know some of that based upon the events that are recorded. We also know some of that based upon some of the tribal names that are missing uh, in these books. In other words, during the exile, Uh, some of the tribes of Israel seem to have been absorbed into the other tribes. Uh, And so you don't see their names coming out of the exile. Um, So anyhow, what you do see, though, in this historical account is that the heart of David shows us fruit again. 1 Chronicles chapter 21, the Bible says, Then Satan stood up against Israel and moved David to number Israel. In other words, we're going to take a census. Now, you might think that's nothing, not a big deal. But the problem is, in the Old Testament, the census was to be ordered by God to be taken, not by the king. But David decided to take a census. So verse 2, So David said to Joab and to the princes of the people, Go, number Israel from Beersheba even to Dan, and bring me word that I may know their number. Joab said, May the Lord add to his people a hundred times as many as they are. But my Lord, the king, Are they not all my Lord's servants? Why does my Lord seek this thing? Why should he be a cause of guilt to Israel? Even Joab knew this wasn't good. Verse 4, Nevertheless, the king's word prevailed against Joab. Therefore Joab departed and went through all Israel and came to Jerusalem. He counts everything. God is displeased. Look at verse 7. God was displeased with this thing, so he struck Israel. Verse 8, David said to God, I have sinned greatly. And that I have done this thing, but now please take away the iniquity of your servant, for I have done very foolishly. And the Lord spoke to Gad, David's seer, saying, verse 10, Go and speak to David, saying, Thus says the Lord, I offer you three things. Choose for yourself one of them, which I will do to you. So Gad came to David and said to him, Thus says the Lord, Take for yourselves either three years of famine, or three months to be swept away before your foes, while the sword of your enemies overtake you, or else three days of the sword of the Lord, even pestilence in the land, and the angel of the Lord destroying throughout all the territory of Israel. Now therefore consider what answer I shall return to him who sent me. David obviously had a problem, because he had to choose what he would see as the lesser of three painful experiences. David would plead with God, I alone am the one who have sinned, The people of Israel have not sinned. That's not the way it works. God operates in this concept at times in communal measures. And that means this, that the people would have to deal with the consequence of the king. Now I want to stop there for a minute because that almost sounds unfair. 
You remember going back to 1 Samuel chapter 8 when the people of God cried out to Samuel for a king and Samuel said, no, they've rejected me. God said what? They haven't rejected you, but they've rejected whom? He said, they rejected me, God. So this whole kingship thing is already a demonstration of reject of God as king. God is not going to, though, snap a finger and take your free will away. He's going to let you choose that. And so in this moment of 1 Chronicles chapter 21, we see David then showing fruits of lack of humility. He wanted to boast about how strong he was. That's why he wanted the census. And I ask you this, when God saw the heart of David, either God knows all or he doesn't know all, did he see that David was capable of demonstrating a lack of humility? And the answer is yes. So in all of that then, the question is, why didn't he, if he sees fruit like you and I see fruit, why wouldn't he have known this is possible in the life of David? And he would have just gone ahead and rejected David an adulterer, David a murderer, David a proud individual. And in all of that, you and I are left, honestly, we're left backing away from this and saying, we may not have every answer to every question, but what we do see is the response of David. The response of David was, when he had sinned with Bathsheba, there was remorse. When he had murdered Uriah, there was remorse. There was a coming back to God. There was a repentance. And even in this moment, when he showed a lack of humility, there was a crying out of, I alone have sinned. But that didn't take away the punishment nor the consequences for his sin. But in all of that, what I understand is, God was able to see even beyond the fruit. Do you hear me? How is it that God sees different than you and I? If you and I see fruit, and God only sees fruit, then therefore you and I see just like God. So there's got to be some difference between you and deity. Otherwise, that makes you like God. And the reality is this, God sees beyond the fruit. And what I challenge you today as this class comes to a conclusion, when you and I see people, is it possible we could grow to see beyond the fruit in their life even if we can't see to the heart of the person in the same way God sees. That would be this. Is it possible that the individual who blew it really bad today, that they are still worthy to be redeemed? The individual who cheated on his taxes, the individual who uh, at one time was a drunk, the individual who one time was a drug abuser, the one time was an adulterer, is it possible that you and I could still see the value in those people? beyond their fruit? And the answer is absolutely yes. Even though we can't see the way God sees exactly, we can learn to see beyond the fruit and say that person still has a soul that is worth redeeming. Now that takes time and that takes effort and quite honestly that takes a lot of disappointment that may take a lot of swallowing of our own pride. That may take a lot of forgiveness. That may take a lot of saying, look, I know you've hurt me. I know that's where you used to be. But I believe that your soul is still worth my attention. You see, when you think about this, I, I find it quite interesting that over and over again, 1 Samuel 13, 14, when Samuel had anointed David, God already refers to him as a man after his own heart. The idea of Acts 13.22 would describe God viewing David as a man who will do all of my will, even though he showed fruit at times of not. First Chronicles 21.8, he would say, I have sinned greatly in this thing that I have done. The, the idea is this, David wasn't a perfect man. And yet God still called him a man after his own heart. There's only one way that I know that to be, and that is this, that he has to look beyond the fruit in David's life. God has the benefit of seeing your heart right now. He knows how many of us are, I mean, this is, this is the reality of it. We're about to enter a time of worship, and no matter what you do on the outside, God knows on the inside if your heart is worshiping Him. You look at that and go, well, that's not nice. That's a two-edged sword, right? 
I mean, I'm glad that He knows me and that He hears me when I don't even know what words to utter in prayer, that He knows my yearnings. But then you tell me He also knows when my heart's not in it? I'm saying yes. That's why the beautiful thing about the God we serve is you can't hide it. The scary thing about the God we serve is you can't hide it. He is not you. You are not Him. But here's who we are. We are trying to walk in the footsteps of Jesus. And as we do, what I notice about Jesus and the way he saw people is he would see beyond their struggles. He would see beyond their circumstances. He would even care enough to see beyond the fruit of the adulterous woman. You say, well, Joe, did he see beyond the fruit of the Pharisees? And I would offer this to you. I believe it's possible to see beyond the fruit, but Jesus saw their heart. And he knew that their heart already was dull of hearing and dull of seeing. He brought that out. We brought that out yesterday. You can't make that call on somebody. You're not him. All you can say is this. They have a soul. And as long as I'm following in the footsteps of Jesus, I'm going to try to see them as a soul who is worthy to be redeemed. Thank you so much for your participation. Let's end with a word of prayer. And then uh, it'll be time to take a break. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, you're so good to us. And as we reflect upon this lesson, Lord, it, it is a case that we've studied often uh, with your servant David. But Lord, there are so many applications that maybe we make to other people that we fail to make to us. And so Lord, I pray that as we look personally upon this text, that we will reflect personally in our own lives. And Lord, that we would really struggle with and be challenged with the way that we see other people. Help us, Lord to see beyond first impressions. Help us to see beyond even the fruit. And help us to see individuals that we come in contact with, not as a cash register attendant, not as a waiter or a waitress, um, not as somebody that we have at work as a co-worker or a fellow student, but Lord, help us to see people as souls who desperately need your Son. And I pray, Lord, that that will draw us to them with that intent. Thank you for this word today, Lord. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thank you so much.